Hello everyone and welcome to Music Theory with Gim. Today's episode will be brought to you by Chrono Trigger's main theme and we're going to be taking a look at the harmonic analysis of what it all contains. We're mostly just going to figure out where these chords are coming from and what key we're pulling from. And then in part two, we're going to check out what Mitsuda is doing to make this theme so hip. I imagine everyone here has pretty much heard the main theme and knows it rather well, but in case you don't or you just want to listen to it again, check out the description below for a link to another video that contains a full transcription of the entire theme as well as a full playthrough of it. Also while you're down there, take note of the timestamps that I've included in case you want to jump around through the video or in case you leave and want to come back later. So we're going to be working in this theme under the assumption that E minor is our primary key. And for some of you, this might be a little bit confusing if you've seen another video that states that we're in the key of A minor, but I feel like we're not there and I'll explain why that is. And even if you disagree with me on it, that's okay, you can still get a lot from this video. But anyways, we're not just going to only pull from E minor, we're actually going to pull from three other keys, and those keys are E major, C major, and D major. And now that we know our tools, let's get this rolling. So right off the bat, you can see why someone might assume that we're in the key of A minor, and that's because we start the song off with an A minor. But just because it's the first chord doesn't mean that that's the key we're in. Whenever we move forward, we never see an A minor again, but we do see a lot of information from E minor. Actually, the entire melody is essentially coming from E minor. We only slightly deviate when we do E major for just a very brief moment, and when we're in the B section, we're pulling from E Dorian, but that's still a color of E minor. So I have a hard time thinking of this as A minor rather than E minor. The problem that this composition poses though is that there are no strong cadences to anything. The entire theme has this air of ambiguity and we're going to talk more about that in part two when we start to conceptualize what's happening. But anyways, if you still disagree with me about this being in the key of E minor, that's cool. You know, you can throw a comment down below and state your case. I'm definitely down for discussing it. But in the meantime, we're going to proceed under the impression that E minor is our primary. Alright, we start off with A minor, which is a minor 4 chord. We then move into F sharp minor, which we're going to see as a 2 chord. And normally in E minor, we want to have a 2 half diminished, but instead we're going to pull from E major, and that gives us the 2 chord. My initial inclination was to think of A minor and F sharp minor as having a chromatic mediant relationship, and you can definitely think that, but I found it a little bit easier to see it as E major, because not only is that the parallel major key to our minor key, but also on top of that F sharp chord we see an E major triad. We then repeat these two chords in the A section, and after that we start to proceed downward, and that gives us F major 7 sharp 11, and that sharp 11 is a good indicator that F is coming from the key of C, and that F is a 4 chord in the key of C, but in this context we're going to view it more as a flat 2 major chord, as it wants to resolve downward to E minor, which it does. And what's really cool about this progression is that we essentially go between three different keys in a span of six measures. We have F sharp minor from E major, we have F major 7 from the key of C, and then we return to E minor with our E minor 9 chord. And even though we're borrowing from three different keys, the half step motions really keep us anchored and we're not sitting here going, what the heck is going on? But, as I'm sure you've already guessed, we'll discuss that in part two. So now we leave E minor and we go into C major, which is going to act as a flat 6 chord. And what's interesting about this chord is it's the first time we're only going to give a chord one measure. Following it is another F major 7 chord, but unlike before, rather than approaching it by half step, we're actually going to go ahead and leap up to that F major 7, and that creates a little bit more tension on it that wants to pull down to E minor, which is what it does. The only problem is that when we get to the E minor, is it's not just E minor, instead of it's really more like an E minor 9. And that's because even though we get the minor third in the harp run, we also get the sus9 voicing in the strings, and the inclusion of the ninth makes it a weaker resolution to E. And once we're done with the E minor chord, we're just going to repeat the entire A section again before proceeding to the B section. And since we all know this theme really well, we know that when the B section hits, it's very different. That said, the harmony is pretty straightforward. It's not far out or anything, or really unrelated, but the mood changes a lot. For instance, rather than continuing the energy of the A section, we lose a lot of it. And we can hear that because the orchestration changes. The snare and timpani are traded out for a shaker, and the rhythms are also very different. We have a lot of long tones, and we've lost pretty much all the driving force that we had before. And that's something totally worth discussing, but we're here for the chords. So, we start off with a G major 7 chord, and we can view this as a flat 3 chord from E minor, but if we look at the context of the entire B section, we're going to see that all of these chords really fit nicely into D major, aside from the B major that occurs. Now, before a new challenger approaches, I know we're not actually in the key of D, but it helps explain where we're pulling our chords from, so that's what we'll be referring them to. Alright, so the G major, what's really cool about it, is it directly contrasts the minor quality that we heard within the A section. 
The major quality is further implemented when we move forward to A major or A69. And what's cool about this is that since we haven't actually modulated the key of D, we don't hear that dominant pull towards D. Instead, we just hear the major sound for what it is. We then move forward to B minor. What's nice about this is it returns us to a little bit of that darker, more serious tone that the minor chords were providing earlier. But rather than thinking this as a simple 5 chord in the key of E minor, we can see in the melody and the harp that a C sharp occurs. And C sharp is not part of E minor, but is instead part of E Dorian, which if you know your modes, is D major. So we're going to call B minor a 6 chord from D, but it is still a 5 in the key of E minor, it's just not a naturally occurring 5. We don't keep that minor sound for long because we then return to G major. This time, however, instead of moving up to another major chord, we actually move down to a minor chord, which is F sharp minor 7. And before, F sharp minor came from the key of E major, but this time it's actually being the 3 chord of D. And we can see that because the melody has a D in it rather than a D sharp. But we do get the D sharp. It just doesn't happen on the F sharp chord. Instead, it happens when B hits. But before the B major comes in, we're going to hear a B sus. And those suspensions, they don't define the sound. So we could expect to hear a B minor chord, but instead, Misuda sneaks in that D sharp. And what's great about hearing this is that it lifts up the sound. And literally it does, because before we heard a D, and we're now raising that up to D sharp. It's a small detail, but it's really, really nice when you hear it. Just listen to it. And then once we've completed the B major, we go for another pass through the B section. Only this time, rather than repeating the entirety of it, we only get six measures. And it's super brilliant because that's just anticipation in the form. So when the C section hits, we immediately get a lot of energy coming from that anticipation. Additionally, Misuda really capitalizes on it because the orchestration's back and in full force. All of our rhythm's there and even more than before. So this is a really good section, but remember, we're here for the changes. So now we're in the C section and we get really straightforward harmony, which is nice because it really anchors everything back to E minor. We get a C major 13, which is just a flat 6 chord in the key of E, and then we're given D6-9, which is really just a flat 7 in the key of E. These two repeat, and then we go for E minor. But rather than getting an E minor, Mitsuda gives us the sus sound, and that's found in an E minor 11 chord. And we're given that because if you look at the strings, we have an E sus happening, but in the melody we have a pretty clear outline of E minor. So we get a little bit of finality, but we also get a whole lot of suspense. So that whole ambiguous atmosphere is completely maintained through the entire theme. And so with that, we've completed the task of analyzing all the chords in terms of Roman numerals. But that's just half the story. There's still a whole lot of information we have to discuss to really understand what Misita is doing within this theme. And we're going to be doing that in part two. But until then, feel free to drop a comment below if you got any thoughts or any questions about anything. Otherwise, this has been Music Theory with Gim, and I'll catch you next time.